So uh, I'm going to be talking about the, the UW Perkin Elmer 6 flex mass spec assay for these listed lysosomal force diseases or, um, or any subset. And then I'm going to be talking about comparison of mass spec and fluorescent assays with a, what I call equivalent cutoffs. Then the analytical range and assay incubation time. A lot of people have asked me about a, a, a assay incubation time. Uh, then post newborn screening mass spec assays to help uh, sort out LSD positive samples and then end with some new pilot studies in the Washington State Lab and expansion to other diseases. And you have the sources of all the information on each slide and all the published information or permission obtained. I, I, I obtained permission for all non-published information and also uh, the slides and will be posted um, on YouTube. There's a link that you can get from my homepage later today. Thank you. So let's go to the next slide. Yeah, so the um, UW Perkin Elmer 6 plex, just to take you through it uh, in 10 seconds. Um, you start with a plate of uh, blood punches and um, you add a single buffer containing six substrates, internal standards, or any subset. This takes about 30 minutes. You incubate three hours to overnight. We'll be talking about that. You add uh, water and ethyl acetate for the liquid-liquid extraction. You mix and spin briefly, and you transfer a portion of the ethyl acetate to a new plate and dry it down. This takes about one hour. And then you add solvents and place it on the auto sampler of the mass spec um, for fully automated data collection and analysis. And the, the method and the SOP are published as shown in the slide. Next slide, please. So the sixplex substrate internal center mix you get from Perkin Elmer, but you can also get any subset. So a number of states are not going to be doing all six, right? Mostly Pompeii, MPS1, and uh, you can work with Perkin Elmer to get whatever mix you need. The buffer is from Perkin Elmer, or you can make your own. The recipe is published. And uh, assays are carried out in a single optimized buffer, which you'll see outperforms the fluorometric assays carried out in individual optimized buffers. Um, and then the buffer contains some inhibitors of off-target enzymes, detergents for lipid substrates, and activators for specific enzymes. Next slide, please. So I want to point out, uh, just as an aside, there may be value in testing for all six LSDs, even if your mandate is fewer. So Kentucky Newborn Screen for Pompe MPS1 and Crabbe uh, is done at the Mayo Clinic, and Dieter Matern and Piero Ronaldo will be presenting their one-year data soon. Uh, I want to point out the use of post-analysis statistical tools called CLEAR, which were developed by Ronaldo, and it makes use of all six enzymes uh, to help sort out the false positives and other factors such as birth weight. And um, the results from Kentucky are showing that the CLEAR tools significantly reduce the false positive rate. And so I think you're going to want to be look at this data. And New York is currently analyzing CLEAR tools uh, in parallel to what they're doing now. Uh, New York currently tests all newborns for XLAD, Pompe, and Crabbe, and they will be adding MPS soon. And then they retest borderline cases with the full sixplex uh, to spot bad samples. For example, all enzymes being low would, would signify a, a bad blood spot. So uh, I, I would encourage you to take a look at these clear tools. Uh, on the next slide, please. Um, I want to point out uh, an additional option, which I think has gone unnoticed, but this is uh, data from uh, a small newborn screening lab, Dr. Berlina in Padova, Italy. Um, they're using the same mass spec for amino acids, acyl carnitines, and LSDs. They just put their LSD runs on the back end of their acyl carnitine amino acid runs because they have extra bandwidth. And you can read what Dr. Polo in the Berlina lab says, but basically they say it works fine. You just have to cr clean the... Uh, source on a regular basis because the lysosomal enzymes are a little bit more sensitive to uh, the assays are more sensitive to uh, source contamination. But if you change the, the probe, clean the probe on a routine basis, it works fine. The implications, I think, is that small states that have extra bandwidth would not need to purchase new instrumentation um, and uh, they could use the same machines that they're using for amino acids and acyl carnitines. And feel free to contact Alberto Berlina about this option. You have his email below. Next slide. Just to show you quickly the current mass spec LSD landscape. Uh, live is New York. You have the diseases that they're, they're mandated. Uh, Illinois, Kentucky, Ohio, Taiwan, and South Australia. And then New Jersey is validating and 
going live soon. And then you have a number of states that are sort of in the validation evaluation phase that I list below. Um, so that just gives you the landscape of what I know about right now. Okay, on the next slide. So part two, I want to compare mass spec and floor metric LSD assays uh, using pilot and live data available from New York, Washington, Illinois, and Missouri. This is all um, published data from Washington and Missouri and New York and Illinois. It's unpublished, with, but I have permission to present. So New York is using mass spec and they're live for Pompe, Crave, and XLAD, and they will be um, adding MPS soon, MPS1 soon. Illinois is live for five of these diseases and they will add Crave, perhaps they've done that already, and they will be adding MPS2 soon. Washington is a six-plex pilot. Missouri, as you know, those are all done by mass spec. Missouri, as you know, does digital microfluidics fluorescence and they're live for um, MPS1, Pompe, Fabre, Gauche, Crabbe. Crabbe is done separately with a standard plate reader uh, because the incubation requires overnight. Okay, on the next slide. So I want to define, of course, the number of screen positives is simply the number of newborns with enzymatic activity below a cutoff. So, of course, we all strive to have the lowest number of screen positives while maintaining false negatives. So, of course, the number of screen positives depends on the chosen cutoff values, and every state chooses their cutoff values differently. Some are more conservative than others. So I think meaningful comparisons can only be made by using equivalent cutoff values. Uh, on the next slide, uh, what I mean by equivalent cu cutoff values is, um, first of all, we cannot use micromoles per hour per liter. We cannot use absolute activities for fluorescence versus mass spec because you know, the substrates are structurally different and the intrinsic enzymatic rates will be different um, and the platforms are different. So method one, which I'll use for Pompe disease, is, is to set the cutoffs to be just above the GAA activity measured with a set of dry blood spots from patients previously diagnosed with Pompe disease. And method two, which I'll use for MPS1 because I don't have this data for affected patients, um, we'll use the percent of daily mean. Um, uh, okay, on the next slide. So this is data from uh, Missouri that we've seen. So uh, they set their referral cutoff in red to be just above the absolute activities measured by digital microfluidics fluorescence for a set of confirmed, well, a set of standard blood spots from uh, infantile onset Pompeys on the left, uh, late onsets in the middle, and then some variations of unknown significance on the right. So New York set their cutoffs, just as for Missouri, to be just above the MSMS activities measured with confirmed Pompe patient dry blood spots. And in fact, some of these blood spots were exchanged between the two labs. Washington uses the same cutoff as New York for Pompe, but Illinois uses a more conservative cutoff value. And for comparison, I will use the equivalent cutoff value for all states, all four states. On the next slide, so we have the number of screen positives with equivalent cutoff values. Um, in Missouri, you have the number of newborns tested uh, or data that I had data as of about a year ago. I think we have more recent data. Uh, actually, this is the more, more recent data from last month's webinar. You have 52 screen positives normalized to 100,000. Washington, uh, the first pilot study we published many years ago was 111,000 with 15 per 100,000 positives. The more recent pilot of 44,000 that was published. You have all the publications below. We have 23. New York, um, 666,000 with 21, and Illinois, uh, 327,000 with 14 screen positives. Okay, on the next slide. So infantile Pompe disease, we all know, is you have low GAA activity in the screen. You have two severe mutations, usually. And these kids are symptomatic based on clinical exam. Right? This is clear cut. Late onset is kind of a messier situation, as you know. You have low GAA activity in the screen. You have two late onset mutations, or possibly one late and one severe. And essentially, as far as we know, most, if not all, of these newborns are asymptomatic at birth. And uh, so we may, these kids may or may not develop Pompe disease, as you know. So I prefer to refer to these patients not as LOPD patients, but as potential LOPD patients because they don't have any disease status um, and may not develop Pompe disease. We just you know, don't know with certainty. Uh, we, you know, the genotype-phenotype correlations are just not that good yet. On the next slide, so I've parsed the data 
uh, from Ponte, you, again, you have the number of screen positives that I told you before. Uh, per 100,000, Missouri found 2.6 infantiles and 8 potential late onsets. New York has 1 infantile and 6 potential late onsets. Uh, Illinois has 0.5 confirmed per 100,000, means 1 per 200,000, of course and three potential late onsets. And in Washington, um, we have zero infantiles and two potential late onsets. Okay, on the next slide. Moving to MPS1, here I'm, I'm using, uh, so Missouri lowered their cutoff for Iguronidae's activity for MPS1 steadily over the years, and this is published. So I'm using the current cutoff value of 7% of the mean IDOA activity to compare all of these four states. So you have 48, screen positives per 100,000 uh, in Missouri. In Washington, you have nine. In New York, you have 16. And in Illinois, you have 12. Okay, and you have the number of newborns tested. On the next slide, again, parsing the data, you have the number of positives. In Missouri, they report one confirmed case. I'm not sure if it's infantile or, or potential or, or known late onset, so I say zero or one in both categories. Um, Washington, uh, we, we didn't have any cases out of 44,000. Uh, New York, uh, in their pilot study, no cases so far. And Illinois, uh, no severe cases as far as I know. Maybe some late onsets, but they're not. Uh, I, I think no, 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 no confirmed late onsets yet, so I'm, I'm calling this zero. Uh, next slide. This is a very important slide. This paper uh, just appeared last week in Clinical Chemistry. So I've been talking about data across different state programs. Now, this is data from the same program in Taiwan. This, these experiments were done by Joyce Liao and Dr. Cheng's lab. They cover about one-third of Taiwan newborn screening. These are identical blood spots uh, tested by standard plate reader fluorescence and mass spec at the same time. So there's no issue about differential storage or anything. These are identical blood spots. So on the left panel, you have the fluorescence uh, reading from the plate reader in arbitrary units. Uh, this is not converted to activity. It's just the reading. Uh, you have uh, about a dozen readings of the blank in the black dots. And then you have four infantiles. You have, um, looks like one, two, three, five potential late onsets. And you have uh, a handful of pseudo deficiencies. Um, and you can see that the infantiles read essentially the blank. The potential late onsets overlap with the infantiles with three of them showing higher. And there's essentially no separation between the pseudo and the late onsets. The same sample is done by mass spec uh, on the right panel. You have one reading of the blank. The IOPD is slightly above the blank. The potential LOPD is overlapping with the IOPD is with some separation but a remarkable complete separation of the pseudo deficiencies from all of the IOPD and PLOPD samples. I think the data is very clear. On the next slide, uh, we expanded the mass spec study to include 250 pseudo deficiencies in Taiwan. So now I'm showing you the actual activity in micromoles per liter per hour. It doesn't really matter. It's just a, a unit conversion. You see the overlap between IOPD and PLOPD, as you saw before. And 96% of 250 pseudo deficiencies separate from the uh, IOPD, PLOPD group. Um, you can see the data. Uh, so I think uh, this doesn't apply to just a few pseudo deficiencies. Now you have data for 250 pseudo deficiencies. Uh, the genotypes of all of these are in the publication, if you want to look. OK, on the next slide. I want to talk about the analytical range because it leads into this issue of incubation time with a number of people have asked me about this. Uh, on the next slide, please. So, you know, why does the mass spec give substantially fewer screen positives per 100,000 than fluorescence at equivalent cutoff? So I can't prove this, but my hypothesis is that this is due to the higher analytical range for the mass spec over the fluorescence. I can't prove causality, so this is just my my hunch. Uh, I think the data is clear. The explanation is not easy to prove. 
So the analytical range I define as the assay response to the enzyme of interest for the quality control high dry blood spot, which is typical of a normal newborn, divided by the assay response due to all enzyme-independent elements. Okay, so this is a form of the blank, but the blank, it's a little bit complicated. There's different kinds of blanks. So, you know, you can have fluorescence due to the substrate itself. You can have product contamination of the substrate. You can have breakdown of substrate to product without enzyme. You can have breakdown with, with the wrong enzyme. You can have background from the blood and you can have all kinds of things. So this is all of this is the uh, all of the signal in the assay that is not due to the enzyme of interest. So I just made up this bar graph. Here is an assay response for the blank on the left and the QC high on the right. And it's just simply the ratio of these two values is the analytical range. And I want to point out that the analytical range of fluorescence with 4MU is considerably lower than mass spec, as you'll see. Because And the main, main reason is that the fluorescent, the substrate itself is fluorescent. And uh, that contributes to the blank. Okay, on the next slide. This is all published, by the way. Uh, you have the paper. Yeah. The analytical range. Um, yes, this is with the plate reader. Um, but I think in Patrick's, in Patrick's um, talk last month, we saw the data for the, for the DMF. Um, I, I want to point out that, um, yeah, here on the next slide, you have the, you have the analytical ranges for the DMF. Um, so we'll, we'll go through that, that I can obtain from the data in the literature. Um, but it's true for digital microfluidics. I mean, the problem is, is the substrate itself is fluorescent, so that doesn't change uh, with digital microfluidics versus play reader. So let's keep going. Um, uh, so now... The, 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 the issue is the mass spec is done overnight, and the fluorescence is done typically three hours for the digital microfluidics. And, um, of course, the analytical range goes up if you go overnight because the blank doesn't go up nearly as much as the uh, re regular sample, the complete assay, because uh, the assay goes up linearly pretty much, and so it, the analytical range gets longer as time goes on. Still, we have data. Uh, so, so on the left, you have data for uh, the analytical range for mass spec at three hours for these four different assays. So 48, 30, 66, and 19 for Fabry, sorry, Pompe, MBS1, Fabry, and Gushy. Then you have the analytical range for digital microfluidics also at three hours. And you can see the mass spec is uh, two to five times larger, two to five times larger. If you go to 16 hours for mass spec, the analytical range gets enormous. Uh, it basically goes up by 16 divided by 3, as you would expect. It now becomes, you know, more than an order of magnitude larger than fluorescence at 3 hours. And I don't have analytical range for digital microfluidics overnight. I, I think nobody's doing overnight digital microfluidics. That would lead to a throughput problem, and it's not clear you can do it. So. I just want to point out that the mass spec data is done in a single buffer. Digital microfluidics are done in individual buffers. And the analytical range for the mass spec is greater than that for digital microfluidics. So the use of individual buffers with digital microfluidics is certainly not an advantage over mass spec with a single buffer. I think the data is clear. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So... This is your trade-offs, and a number of people asked me about three hours mass spec, and the answer is I don't have extensive pilot studies. You know, when we did this early on, we were early. We had to include Crave disease because of the New York, New York and Illinois mandate, and so everything got pushed into an overnight because you cannot do Crave three hours, the fluorescent assay, the mass spec assay. The enzyme is too low. It's much lower than the others, and I've said this many times. So if you're going to do Crave overnight, you might as well do all the others overnight, but Anyways, many of you are not doing CRAVE, so it's not an issue. So if you're not including CRAVE, you certainly can do a three-hour incubation with mass spec. And a number of states I know are going to be exploring this option. And my prediction is you will have more screen positives compared to mass spec with overnight, but uh, less than with digital microfluidics with three hours. So unfortunately, I cannot give you a rock-solid answer about this. I can only give you a prediction. Um, but... 
Uh, if you look at the analytical ranges, I think you have a re reasonable prediction. Okay, on the next slide. Moving to the uh, next topic, I, I want to show you some recent data on use of mass spec for post-newborn screening and analysis uh, in leukocytes. On the next slide. Uh, we have what I think is very exciting data from Dr. Chun Li Yu at Mount Sinai Medical School um, on a number of screen positive samples from Pompe coming out of the New York Newborn Screening Lab. This paper was recently published in Clinical Chemistry. Um, so this is blood leukocytes. Um, and you have the IOPD cohort, the LOPD cohort, the Pompe disease, uh, pseudo deficiency mutation combined with a pathogenic mutation, the pseudodeficiency combined with a VUS, pseudodeficiency combined with pseudodeficiency and the carriers. So this is done with an LC mass spec assay, which has an enormously high analytical range of about 600. Um, and what's going on with LC is uh, that what limits the analytical range in the flow injection mass spec is there's a little bit of breakdown of product, uh, substrate to give product in the heated electrospray source. But by LC, the substrate and the product separate, so any in-source breakdown of substrate to product is irrelevant because you only integrate the product peak. Um, anyways, uh, for the first time ever uh, that I know of, we've been able to separate the IOPD from the LOPD group uh, using GAA assays in the leukocytes. Typically, it's well known in the literature that these, these guys display overlapping activities. Um, I think this is a very exciting result. Now, this is a very small cohort of patients, so let's let's see for the future. On the next slide, uh, you have preliminary data. We're just getting started with Laura Parler and Tim Wood at Greenwood. Um, you have these pseudo deficiencies for MPS1, well separated from the MPS1 affected in leukocytes. Again, using high analytical range LC mass spec. On the next slide. Uh, this also works for Crowley disease. I'm not going to go into details. Uh, it's published recently. Um, on the next slide. So just to finish in a minute with some ongoing Washington pilot studies and expansion to other diseases. On the next slide, please. So in Washington, we're currently running a multiplex mass spec assay for MPS2, 3B, 4A, 6, and 7 and we have data out to 30,000. So far, it looks very robust. Screen positives are remarkably low. Uh, we'll be presenting this over the coming year. We have a second pilot study on metachromatic leukodystrophy and cerebrotendinous xanthomatosis, which is called CTX. This is a bile acid disorder, and it looks like CTX is going to be nominated for Rusk consideration soon, and MLD may follow after that. We don't know. And I just want to mention that there's currently no fluorometric assays of these conditions on the horizon. Um, these are biomarker uh, for MLD. We look at sulfatides in dry blood spots. For CTX, we look at bile intermediates in dry blood spots. These are done together in the same run. And uh, I'm sorry, the reference. Oh, yeah, sorry. So the, the description of the MPS assay has, uh, has just been published. Uh, there's no publication on the MLD CTX yet. You have the publication at the bottom. On the next slide, just to end. Yes, in Washington, we have no parent consent, so it's all um, what we can do is uh, we, we can do uh, enzyme activity and uh, we can do genotyping. We cannot identify the patients for follow-up. Like in most states in the United States, this is a problem. Yeah, so that's, you know, that's, that's a limitation to the Bible study, but I think you still get most of the information. This is a controversial topic, but it is not a, it's a de-identified study, so it's not prospective. Um, on the last slide, I just want to mention the tetracosuplex. Uh, sorry for the name. This is more than you want to know about, but I really think it illustrates the power and flexibility of mass spec. And a number of people out there in the newborn screening labs have commented to me about their appreciation of the flexibility of mass spec. I think fluorescence, I think it works. I think it's fine. It's an alternative that's useful. Um, I don't think 
it's the future for many diseases coming down the line. I think mass spec is the only way. But anyways, that's my opinion. Uh, enzyme assays, we do. So this is a two-minute, a single two-minute LC mass spec run. And I want to remind you that, so you have to do LC, but Illinois has been doing LC mass spec for the past few years, and it, it's very robust as long as you uh, look after your pumps in a, in a sort of prophylactic way. I think it's no problem. It's very robust. Um, I don't think it's highly complex. I don't think it's much different than flow injection. Uh, you're, everybody is injecting a flow stream into their mass spec. The, in LC, you have a column in the tubing. Uh, enzyme assays, you can do all the six plaques that I mentioned throughout the talk. You can also do all the MPSs. You can do lysosomal acid lipase, uh, CLNF types 1 and 2, um, biotinidase and GALT fit very nicely into this panel. But at the same time as we do these enzyme assays, we can do the biomarkers, cycosine for Crave, glycosyl, glucosyl sphingosine for Gauche, lysosphingomyelin for neiman picked AB, lysoGB3 for Fabry, sulfatides for MLD, and bile derivatives for CTX and neiman pixi So you can combine all these biomarkers with the enzyme assays uh, in the same two-minute run. And then on the last slide, please. Uh, to summarize, uh, the University of Washington Perkin Homer 6 Plex I want to, yeah, again, point out that if you want to just do Pompeii and MTS-1, just talk to Perkinomer. They'll sell you what you want. You don't have to pay for all six. Uh, it's being piloted and used in several newborn screening labs in the U.S. and worldwide. And based on large data sets, um, we're seeing three to eight-fold lower number of screen positives at equivalent cutoff values. And I want to stress that any comparison across these platforms has to be done at equivalent cutoff values. And uh, otherwise, it's kind of meaningless. Uh, there's no large-scale pilot data f for mass spec with a three-hour. Uh, I, I know of at least one state that's going to be evaluating this. But the prediction is, is that the number of screen positives will be more than that obtained with overnight incubations, but less than obtained with three-hour fluorometric. The analytical range of mass spec is much larger than fluorescence, especially with LC. Um, and these are the numbers for LC, by the way. Um, and it allows unprecedented, st unprecedented stratification of early versus late pseudo and pseudo-deficiency newborns. And then I think mass spec provides increased expansion possibilities compared to fluorescence in that it allows diseases to be analyzed for which there's no fluorometric assay on the horizon. And then the last slide is just to point out that I've had a large number of people contribute to this data. And I thank you for your attention. I just want to say if you have questions beyond the Q&A, you can email me. And also the slides with audio will be, uh, you'll see a link to YouTube on my homepage you have at the top. Thank you very much.